this is it? It's the same computer we've used, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gads. <laughs> Thanks. Were there any questions from last time? And you know, I'd love it, well, I guess we're not gonna make people move up, but it would have been great to have you all come down to the front. Okay, we finished the liver and we had started the intestine. Did we finish the intestine? I think I did, right? Can I see nods? Did I, yeah, thank you. Um, and I did not start muscle, correct? correct? Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, oh, that's not good. Okay, so we have a few organs to get through <laughs> today. So let me start with the muscle. Can everybody see that all right with the lights? Oh, that's as far as it goes. Um, Okay, so we're gonna go back. Um, I mean, we're, we're gonna basically trace after a meal, right? We, get, we talked about the liver metabolism of amino acids. Now we're gonna talk about what happens at the muscle. And the first question I have is which amino acids bypass the liver uniquely, really, to come to the muscle in the fed state? What is, what is that big class of amino acids that manages to get to the muscle after branch chain, right? We said liver doesn't do much of anything with those branch chain amino acids. Um, so 70% of the amino acids leaving the liver are branch chains. And um, when they get to the muscle, what do you think they're used for in the fed state? What do you think any tissue is doing in the fed state, really, with amino acids first and foremost? What? Anabolism. Anabolism, right, thanks. Protein synthesis, right? Whatever muscle, whatever proteins are needed in the muscle, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna use those for um, protein synthesis. And of course, some will get catabolized as well. And then when we talk about fed, I'm gonna talk about fed and fasted and how muscle metabolism of amino acids changes. I'll just reiterate, remember what I said in the fed state, branch chain amino acid concentrations immediately after a meal go up several fold, and that's kind of unique. Um, that's because the rest of them get kind of distributed, metabolized, utilized um, in the liver. The liver lets a certain amount go through. There's sort of a constitutive uh, concentration of the rest of the amino acids, but the branch chains go up several fold after a meal. Um, the other ones remain relatively constant between fed and fasted. So branch chain amino acid concentration really reflects, you know, fed state, dietary intake. Um, okay, so we have, these are what they look like, and the reason they're called branch chain seems hopefully obvious to you. These are the R groups and they are branched, right? I'm not gonna ask you to, to do the, um, to write out the structures, but you've already learned that in biochem, I think, so. Now, there are two steps in branch chain amino acid metabolism, catabolized, the first, the first two steps, it's not the only, but the first two steps. Um, branch chain amino acid trans, amino transferase, and I've got that written out on the next slide fully so you can see it. Um, note, again, as with any other transamination reaction, you've got glutamate involved, you've got PLP, pyridoxal phosphate, um, in the active form of vitamin B6, you get to the alpha keto acid, and I'm not asking us to focus on this, um, the names of those, and it, it would behoove you to, to learn the end products, if you would, isoleucine, um, valine, succinyl-CoA, and then leucine, acetyl-CoA, and acetoacetate, which means that it is really um, only ketogenic, while, whereas um, valine is uh, uh, only or pri primarily uh, glucogenic and uh, isoleucine is yielding acetyl-CoA and propionyl-CoA. Um, there are a lot of different steps catalyzed by BCKAD. 
and I'm not going to go through them. And um, I will just say this here, that the BCAAT, just like any other amino transferase, is in both the cytosol and the mitochondria of muscle cells, whereas BCKAD is a mitochondrial only enzyme. And we'll say a bit more about them individually. So here's BCAAT, cellular location, I just said, both cytosol and mitochondria. What type of reaction is it? Transamination, right? It's reversible. And then what about BCAAT activity in muscle compared to the liver? What do you think? Is it higher in the muscle than the liver? Yes, almost essentially no activity in the liver and much higher in the muscle. That's significant, okay, that point, because it allows for a fate other than immediate degradation in the liver. If the, if the enzyme that is the first step of the degradation of BCAAs is not active in the liver, then that means it allows for those BCAAs to leave the liver to other tissues. Any questions about that? And then what happens to the alpha keto acids of the branch chains? I'm going to show you in a diagram, but I'll just say it here. In the fed state, those keto acids can be transported on albumin to other tissues in the blood. The keto acids, once they get to the liver, they can be oxidized because the liver has BCKAD, the second enzyme, right? Just doesn't have the transamination reaction. So the liver can catabolize them and turn them into fat or uh, glycogen as, as the, the need may be. If they go to other tissues, they can be reaminated. Not reanimated, but reaminated. Um, because other tissues have the BCAAT, the transaminase reaction. So they can re stick on an ammonia and use those other tissues, can then use the branch chain amino acid that gets regenerated for protein synthesis, which is an important thing to be able to do in a fed state. If you don't have enough carbohydrate, of course, you can use the, uh, the liver will, you know, turn those into glucose and or energy. And in the case of specifically isoleucine and valine, we can store that carbon skeleton also as fat, but also as glycogen. Um, I show you a diagram, so that was a lot to say, but I'll, I'll reiterate those things. In the fasted state, more than 24 hours into a fast, when your glycogen is typically gone, and under a very unique con uh, physiologic condition that we call metabolic stress, which is not when you're taking a quiz or an exam, but when you've had a major traumatic injury or major surgery, you're in the ICU, and you mount a, a response to that injury, the metabolism for using those muscle branch chain amino acids, particularly leucine, um, we get a lot more oxidation of leucine particularly, further oxidation in muscle. Those BCKAs, actually all of them get further oxidized. Leucine's the one that generates a lot of energy and I'll show you how that works. So skeletal muscle is a reservoir for us. We always talk about that. This is how it works. If you break down muscle, the branch chains get uniquely, you know, get utilized um, for oxidation under those conditions. Um, okay, now I'm on BCKAD, the dehydrogenase um, cellular location, I said was mitochondria. Type of reaction, it's just like or very, very similar to the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. Do you remember what class that was in or what do you remember about PDH? Is it a reversible or irreversible reaction? Irreversible. Did you learn that it was oxidative decarboxylation by any chance? Okay, well, I'll tell you that. Structurally, very similar to pyruvate dehydrogenase. It has three enzyme subunits, very complex, ancient 
you know, really uh, very archaic um, enzyme, genetically speaking. So just like PDH, it has three enzyme subunits. Just like PDH, it gets activated, and de uh, activated by a kinase, so it gets phosphorylated to be active. And it also has all the same cofactors that PDH has, which I find interesting. So if you've learned what the cofactors are for PDH, this will not be difficult. Um, it's where all the vitamins come in. This is where, when I used to teach vitamins and minerals and amino acid metabolism, we would get big picture because a lot of, there's a lot of interplay and, and uh, overlap between vitamin metabolism and amino acid metabolism. Um, so the necessary cofactors is the next question. Oh, I had that on the slide, didn't I? Did I get that to you? Sorry about that. Um, I just got all sorts of answers in here. Okay, the necessary cofactors are on the next slide, so I'll just, I'll, I'll mention that when I show you that. Now, BCKAD activity in liver compared to muscle under normal physiologic conditions when you're eating regularly, the activity is much higher in liver than muscle. And so if you, I want you to think about why that might be for a moment, and I'm not going to belabor it too much because we do have a lot to cover today, so I, I would normally do a little breakout where we could actually think about this. It's not ideal, but I will just tell you um, that allows for those BCKAs, those keto acids, to leave the muscle when you're in the fed state and you're, you're, you're eating regularly. You don't need to oxidize those keto acids for energy in the muscle under those conditions. Does that make sense? You want to be able to, you know, allow them to go to other tissues where they can be used for protein synthesis, et cetera. Um, however, and I'll say it here, and I'll say it again in the next couple slides here, in the fasted state and under that unique condition we call metabolic stress, or I'm calling metabolic stress, the BCKAD activity in muscle escalates by five-fold really ups increases, which allows the muscle then to oxidize those for energy um, and yeah, basically further catabolizes those branched chain amino acids. So the whole point of the different, I mean you've got different cellular location in the muscle with these two enzymes. And we have this sort of differential activity of BCAAT, well, both enzymes, really, under different physiologic states between liver and muscle, there are different levels of activity. That division of labor in both div division of location as well as division of labor between those two organs allows for different needs to be met, right? Sometimes we're going to oxidize, um, we'll just do the first step and then those keto acids go off and we can, you know, in the fed state, we're going to use those for protein synthesis and other things, or making fat or glycogen or whatever in the liver. In the fasted state, in metabolic stress, we're going to use those immediately for energy because the enzyme activity for BCKAD goes up under those conditions. Okay, so it's another example, really, of inner organ cooperativity, if you will, for biochemistry. Here are the cofactors for the BCKAD uh, enzyme, and it is a very complex enzyme. Like I said, three subunits, it was to draw it out. It took like eight slides to get you through the reaction. It's pretty cool what each one of these things does, but I'm not gonna ask you that. Just know that thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, these B vitamins, really important. We talk about energy metabolism. You already hopefully have an appreciation for the importance of FAB and NAD, all of these B vitamins when people talk about taking them for energy metabolism, whether or not that actually boosts your energy is you know, debatable, but it's not debatable that these, protein, these vitamins are definitely integral to our energy metabolism. Okay, we've got a genetic, um, oh, wait, I need to go back. I just wanna repeat what I said a moment ago about the regulation of this enzyme, which um, I mentioned, I'm just gonna say it again, that there's a branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, BCKAD kinase enzyme that activates it by phosphorylating the enzyme. That kinase act, act, uh, enzyme is active under low insulin conditions, which is the fasted state, and 
when we're talking about metabolic stress, that is, and it is a combination of things that are driving it in metabolic stress. The activity of that kinase is influenced by cytokines. These are chemical mediators that drive what we call the metabolic response to stress. And incidentally, under those conditions, those counter-regulatory hormones to insulin are also making us insulin resistant, right? So it's also essentially a low insulin condition. But it's not just low insulin that's driving it in stress. It's other things that are also driving it. Other questions about that? OK. All right, what disorder results? Anybody know? If there is a defect in the, ooh, I, ugh, it's on your slide, isn't it? I can't even see. Oh, I didn't give you the, I could have asked that. Darn it. <laughs> Did you, would you have known that? Had you ever heard of maple syrup urine disease? I mean, what a great name, right? <laughs> it's not great if you have it, so forgive the pain. Um, it's a genetic disorder. We screen for it at birth. Can you imagine? Well, okay, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Why would we call it maple syrup urine disease? Does it look like maple syrup? or smell like maple syrup. It smells like it's maple syrup, right? Yeah, I mean, what's, could be worse, right, maybe. No, it's not a, not a good thing to have, obviously. Um, so it's a buildup of the branched chain amino acids and the um, keto acids that causes the maple syrup, uh, urine, you know, the smell, and that drives neurologic problems. So um, mental, uh, uh, neurologic changes that result in death if untreated within 10 days of birth. So it's a, it's a very important um, thing to screen for. Like PKU, we give branched chain amino acid free um, supplements, uh, infant formula, specialized infant formula, and just enough breast milk or regular formula to meet protein synthesis needs, monitor growth of the child, monitor blood concentrations of the BCAAs and the BCKAs. Uh, and people are living longer and with better management. So we're, we're doing a better job of um, keeping those kids alive and well. Okay, so I've got a picture now, and I've got a similar kind of, um, actually here I don't have anything produced. I've got all only export items, so my sunshine um, symbol. We're in the muscle in the fed state. It's a little bit busy, I know it's busy, so let me just see if I can, where my animation starts us here. So we've got all three of the amino acids, the branched chain amino acids, they are coming in in the fed state from the liver, right, to the muscle tissue. They undergo the BCAAT reaction, producing the BCAA alpha keto acids, or the branched chain keto acids, if you want to write BCKA, um, however you learn those, uh, that, the, the kind of abbreviation. We'll hold on this, what happens uh, to these in a moment. Um, in that reaction, of course, you're producing glutamate because it's the intracellular <laughs> hub, which can then um, interact with pyruvate through the ALT reaction. And alanine is a major export product from muscle metabolism of, of uh, branch chain amino acid metabolism. So alanine is our first export. The other so these three enzymes, I want you to circle them, BCAAT, glutamine synthetase, and ALT, these are the three main enzymes that, are, uh, that we're gonna talk about in the fed state in muscle. So where else, we've talked about glutamine synthetase before, right? Where did, where, what, where did, the, um, did that enzyme show up before? We talked about last time, what cells? Or organ, first organ, what organ? No, not the intestine. Remember, the intestine uses glutamine, so it does not synthesize glutamine. It uses glutamine, so it's, a, it's got glutaminase, right, that breaks it down. But it comes from, yeah, from the very good liver and exactly paravenous hepatocytes, thank you. So the paravenous hepatocytes are, have, it's another place, a major place where glutamine is synthesized. Right from ammonia, that backup plant, and we also I talked about how it changes. We'll, we'll talk more about it. So the muscle, importantly, has a way of dealing with the ammonia that gets produced from this the the reaction. I mean, it, it's basically um, it's a way for it to export 
that ammonia that gets produced through pentose phosphate pathway and other, other um, reactions um, to make glutamine. So major export glutamine and alanine coming from the muscle in the fed state in a you know, much greater proportion than you would find in muscle protein, for example. That's how we know these things. We, we track it with tracers. Now up here, back up here, the branch chain keto acids go to other tissues for reamination for protein synthesis. Please make a note up here if it helps you. Not liver, <laughs> right? Not liver. The liver does not have the BCAAT enzyme to do that. It would have taken whatever it needed for its own purposes before it let the rest go for synthesis purposes. Um, if those go to the liver, and they do, right? So they, they go to other tissues for synthesis. They also can go to the liver, but only for further oxidation or turning into fat and glycogen, right? They go through the BCKAD enzyme reaction and then have other fates. Are there any questions about this one? Okay. Now, fasted. Oh, I misspoke a moment ago. Can I correct that in case? It, I'm not going to ask you about this, but just for completion. I said the ammonia comes, I don't know what I said, but let me say what I should have said. The ammonia in this case is coming from the purine nucleotide cycle. If you've learned about that, don't worry about it. I'm not going to ask you that, but just for completion purposes, purine nucleotide cycle. Um, OK. Now, in the fasted state, we're going to have low, it will say, low insulin conditions, right? Um, under these conditions, as I told you, the BCKAD activity, enzyme activity, increases several fold. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let me um, think about where I want to go. So when that happens, um, I'll just show it over here first. Okay, we'll talk about leucine first. So, so you've got the BCKAD act, uh, enzyme acting, you get the alpha keto acid of leucine, that BCKAD activity increases several fold and allows for, in the case of leucine, very rapid oxidation, very similar to fatty acid oxidation, actually. It produces acetyl-CoA and acetyl acetoacetate. You get complete oxidation to ATP, essentially. And it, and it generates a good amount for the muscle under those conditions. The same reactions are going on over here. Let's talk about valine and isoleucine um, are going to go through those uh, transamination reaction, you know, um, and then ALT. We've got alanine and glutamine coming out. Um, over here, the keto acids, these are, I should have labeled these, but these are specifically for these two, valine and isoleucine, go through partial oxidation, and they end up with PCA and inter intermediate. Okay, so the main point here is leucine gets completely oxidized to ATP. Very efficient uh, production of acetyl-CoA that enters um, TCA and complete oxidation. Nitrogen still going out as alanine and glutamine. The proportion tends to vary depending on the ammonia concentration in the cell. We're not going to get into that per se. If you've got more ammonia, you tend to get more glutamine formed. Um, I would hazard a guess from my um, previous, I was more uh, in, in uh, what do you call it, in depth uh, or wrapped up in this, this material. Um, I always used to say alanine probably is more important in a fast because of its role in um, you know, gluconeogenesis elsewhere than glutamine, but don't worry too much about that uh, level of detail. Okay, any questions about the muscle? Okay, let's talk about the kidney. I, kidneys, right, we usually have two. We can't live without two, so I've, I've used it as one tissue name, kidney. Um, now, um, so I've got a, a list here, and then I've got some diagrams, and so this is sort of as um, organized a little bit so that we can go back as we were viewing. So the kidneys, um, are the site where you got preferential uptake of, so glutamine, alanine, 
and citrulline, right? And so glutamine and alanine produce with the muscle. Part of where they go is the kidney. Um, glutamine and alanine coming in from muscle, important and fed and fasted states. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm not sure where I say it, I'm gonna say it now and then I'll reiterate it when I get to a diagram, I mean a uh, schematic. These amino acids at the kidney are also become more important, even more important in the condition of a fast and also metabolic acidosis. Okay, now that's a different thing than what I just mentioned a moment ago, metabolic stress, okay? So we also have clinically, again, I'm always trying to draw, bring this back to things that can happen in the <coughs> clinical setting in the case of um, somebody with type 1 diabetes, if anyone has known anybody that's had diabetic ketoacidosis, that's a form of metabolic acidosis. So acid-base disturbances are relevant to biochemistry, relevant to clinical management of patients, for sure, right? So that's what I'm going to tell you about, metabolic acidosis, and also fast. Now they tend, we'll talk a little more about that, so I'll hold the additional thought. Um, you might as well write it down here because it's going to come up again, but the kidneys, did you all know that the kidneys is the only other organ that has the enzyme machinery for gluconeogenesis from, from the liver? Yay, great. Okay, so we're gonna, that becomes more important in, a, in an extended fast. Um, and then we've already talked about citrulline coming in. Now incidentally, glycine and aspartate also come in. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. And then there's uh, another important thing um, besides uptake of particular amino acids is what the kidneys will produce or release. One of them is histidine. And so I say, you know, we talk about essentiality of histidine. Um, it's not that we're synthesizing the R group uniquely, but histidine gets released from a, from a peptide called carnosine. Um, so it's not synthesized, but it does get released from the kidney. Um, major site for production of arginine, we've already talked about that. Guanido acetate, I'll just give you a little FYI, I don't think I, I, I know I don't ask about this, but it's for car um, creatine synthesis. Right? Where does creatine show up in your body? Muscle. And what's the purpose of it? Energy, right? High energy, really high energy. The run for the bus or run from the grizzly bear kind of you know, creatine phosphate. Or actually probably more like lifting the bus off of the, you know, your foot or I don't know. <laughs> creatine phosphate, high energy. Anyway, that's quantido acetate. That's just an FYI. Serine is a non-essential amino acid. Just it's made from glycine. So don't worry too much about those details, um, but histidine being released, that's important. Arginine, very important. We're gonna talk about arginine synthesis next. Oh, and I've got this diagram. I just am showing you how these things happen. I'm not gonna ask you about this. Sorry to just be I'm sometimes a little too complete. Um, whenever ammonia at the kidney, ammonia uh, gets combined with hydrogen for ammonium ion um, excretion. This is showing us how we get to arginine. We're gonna talk about the enzyme machinery. You've already learned it, right? It's got partial urea cycle in the kidney, just like partial urea cycle in the intestine allows for uh, the citrulline to be produced and brought in. With aspartate, we get arginine. There's the guanido acetate that gets shipped out. I'm sorry, this is really, arginine gets shipped out. This is a very important thing from the kidney. Here's the histidine story. Um, this is glutamine coming in. This is particularly important. This whole excretion of um, ammonium ion, we're gonna talk more about it in a second. It serves ammonia that gets released from glutamine, gets, gets a, uh, acts as kind of an, uh, an acid sink, if you will. It combines to make ammonium, and when it's in ammonium, it goes out in the urine it allows us to get rid of acid when we're in acidosis and when we're in a fast, which is an acidotic kind of condition. Alanine coming in helps us get to glucose. Okay, this is a confusing slide, so I'm gonna just click on and I'm gonna show you those again in a more um, organized fashion. I think we've seen this slide before, right? Yes, remember this, the kidney what's happening with the citrulline that comes in, all of the machinery to keep this as a 
cyclical pattern, fumarate getting regenerated back to aspartate allows this to continue. And remember that arginase is present technically, it's there in the kidney, but very, 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 very minimal, if any, activity. Because any arginase that might incidentally get made gets immediately feedback inhibited by ornithine. Because ornithine's got nowhere to go. Okay, so there are small amounts of ornithine, small amounts of arginase, doesn't really, I mean, not necessarily small amounts of ornithine, but um, the arginase activity is minimal, if any. So you, again, I asked you last time, make sure you write big letters on this slide, again, here, the kidneys do not make urea, okay? They do not make urea. The whole point of this is to make arginine to, to in the fed state, and so this is driven by enzyme activity and, and you know, the, the um, substrate, you know, uh, activation to, um, When amino acid concentrations are high, right, coming into the gut, in the intestine, right, the, that high amino acid concentration and um, drives production of citrulline because you've got dietary, dietary arginine that comes in, right, drives the acetylglutamate synthesis, synthetase and all of the activity that, that drives production of citrulline through those steps that you've, you've learned. Um, and so the arginine that, um, you know, is made in the liver under those conditions just immediately gets catabolized to urea, right? So we have to have a way of getting arginine to the rest of the body, essentially, for protein synthesis. So that's how the cooperation between the intestine and the kidney or kidneys works. Is there a are there questions about that? Okay. I think I've written it out here anyway. Now, um, so nitrogenous wastes. Um, this is, again, for, for, for reasons of being complete, I will just focus your attention on two areas. Yes, all of this is true. Under normal physiologic conditions, when we're not in acidosis and we're you know, eating regularly and we're not under metabolic stress or anything else, 80% of our nitrogen goes out as urea. Okay, so under normal physiology, 80% of the nitrogen goes out as urea. In a prolonged fast and in metabolic acidosis, we increase how much goes out as ammonia. So it, it becomes more like a 50-50 split. The nitrogen, half of it's urea, half of it as um, in the form of ammonia. And I'm going to explain why that is. Again, it's back to that idea of excreting acid as ammonium ion. And the way they, that the kidneys do this is they've got uh, some machinery here to deal with and metabolize glutamine. So the first en enzyme, three key enzymes, first one is glutaminase to break down glutamine to glutamate. Um, what enzyme, is, you guys have it, I've written it in here, right? GDH is the second enzyme, glutamate dehydrogenase. Last time I had a question in my mind about the irreversibility of that, I had written it as a reversible reaction. It is technically reversible, but at normal physiology in mammals to almost to, you know, almost 100% of the time, it's moving in the direction that I've shown it to you, that it's, you know, it's breaking down glutamate to yield ammonia and alpha ketoglutarate. So it is, I didn't write it reversibly here. I'm not going to ask you that detail because it's anything that's confusing like that. I don't, I certainly don't ask you about it and it's not that critical. But just so you know, it is technically uh, reversible, but we are always, almost always moving in the direction of yielding ammonia and alpha ketoglutarate. Um, the third enzyme, we're gonna just call it ALT, alanine aminotransferase, because that's the, lar by far and away, the most activity is ALT, but there are potentially other transaminase reactions, in, and they are present in the kidney, and can transaminate other amino acids as well to get, uh, 
to alanine. If there, if there are other amino acids, we ultimately have to get to pyruvate for gluconeogenesis. Okay, so I'm gonna just, just for our purposes, just think of it as ALT, circle that one, um, because that's getting immediately pyruvate into the glucose, um, gluconeogenic pathway. So, oh, back. Um, give me a second here. I'm just gonna make sure I'm gonna say this right. So, down here. So, the, the importance of the kidney under these conditions where you have both metabolic acidosis and an extended fast. An extended fast, particularly, probably makes sense to gluconeogenesis, right? We, the kidneys become more important as time goes on to producing glucose. Um, becomes sort of a half and half as far as I understand and with the liver in terms of producing glucose. And what we're doing is we're essentially using glutamine carbon to make glucose in this way. And when we do that, when we yield alpha ketoglutarate, okay, we're also, we're making glucose. The other thing we do with alpha ketoglutarate is we oxidize it to TCA. And when we do that, we produce a new bicarbonate molecule. One to one for ammonia coming off of glutamine, each glutamine ammonia that, that we yield, there's a bicarb that also gets yield. And that helps to correct the pH, the bicarbonate, right? You think of that as helping to counter that acidotic pH. And the other thing that is happening, again, with that ammonia is that you're sinking acid that way too. So you're making, it, it's a simultaneous correction of pH. Um, I've, I've written it more simply that we're, ex just, we're excreting ammonium ion, but in your mind when you, we're doing that here, we're also generating a, a new bicarb. So we're correcting the pH. So however you wanna think about that, that it's an acid sink or, and or that it's a bicarb gets produced at the same time, that's how it happens. Um, we're correcting the, the acidotic, you know, the acid pH, we're, we're basically bringing the pH slowly up by doing this, metabolizing glutamine. Is that, are there questions about that? So it's pretty, it's kind of interesting, I think, utilizing glutamine in this way. And the three enzymes, glutaminase, GDH, and ALT, um, And I've got a summary there, and I think I have given you most of those, reminding you the key points I want you to focus on. All right, in the last section. Oh wait, I have to give you a break, don't I? That's good. We're in good shape. Go take a break. Shall we take a break? Um, let's see. And we end up. Yeah, I think I've got plenty of time. So if you really want, do you really want to take a ten-minute break, or would you rather kind of maybe five minute and then maybe finish a bit early? Huh? What do you think? Shall we take a five-minute break and see where we? And I'm not going to promise we will leave you early. That is not. I shouldn't have said that. Can we take five though? Because that's too much. Thank you. back mostly. Um, so I'd like to end with, I always like to say this is more than you've ever wanted or even dreamed that it's possible to know about the amino acid glutamine. And I, and I think partly this is because when I was a dietitian, glutamine was really hot in the research realm Everybody was talking about glutamine metabolism. They were trying to give glutamine to people with inflammatory bowel problems and other things. Um, and so I got into the biochemistry of it and I find it very interesting. So bear with me. I'm gonna tell you more about glutamine than you may ever want to know. But you've already learned a lot about it, so I will try not to make you, you know, feel like you have to fall asleep here. Um, we've, we have already learned that there's an inner cellular, if you will, glutamine cycle. It's not really a cycle, it's actually a misnomer, so actually you can put an X through that because it's not a cycle in the traditional way, but we've talked about how there's um, different enzyme machinery 
and different subsets of cells, as well as subcellular locations, um, so that we don't have a futile cycle going, right? So that in the paraportal hepatocytes, you've got glutaminase that breaks down glutamine. I mean, yeah, to get, sorry, well, suddenly I had a brain problem there. Um, that produces ammonia, right, to go into the urea cycle. That's all very, very important, especially in the fed state, right? And then we also have this sort of backup plan, glutamine synthetase in those cells as blood's leaving the liver, any ammonia that's in there, glutamine synthetase has a real high affinity for and will just sap up all that ammonia, anything that might be left over or coming in from else, other tissues, whatever, I mean, it's typically just what escapes or, um, and there are certain conditions that will allow that extra ammonia, more of it to be going into glutamine synthesis at the paravenous hepatocyte. So now where I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna add nuance to that knowledge about that, because um, we're gonna talk about different physiologic conditions that drive more glutamine synthesis uh, or more urea synthesis under different conditions. Now, the other nuance I'm gonna add is beyond the liver. We've already talked about some of these enzymes Glutaminase activity in, in the intestine, and I've told you that glutamine synthetase is in the muscle. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's just fill this in, right? Um, I, I think I didn't give you the boxes, right? Okay, so thank you for. <laughs> so this one, the, the having glutamine synthesis, synthetase in the liver, allows the liver to make glutamine for other tissues one of which is enormous consumer of, of glutamine is the intestine, right? We've already talked about that. That happens under lots of conditions. It's normal physiology. But these cells and the synthesis of glutamine from the liver becomes ever more important under the condition of an extended fast and metabolic acidosis. And let me, let me see what, um, yeah. In the muscle, glutamine synthesis or synthetase is all about detoxifying the ammonia that is yielded from amino acid metabolism there. And the muscle under normal, you know, the, the skeletal muscle is an enormous organ, right? I mean, one organ, but we, we talk about it right that way. It's an enormous tissue, right? So it generates a lot of glutamine. Under normal conditions, it's the major supplier of glutamine to the intestine, right? And then the brain also has glutamine synthetase, and that's to export ammonia, detoxify ammonia from amino acid metabolism there. So the, you know, it's not a huge amount that comes out, but not compared to the muscle, but still very important. So if you just remember, the most important thing I want you to walk away with is ammonia is toxic. So we are not allowing ammonia to get into the bloodstream from any tissue that has amino acid metabolism going on, which is every tissue, right? So, um, you know, the intestine, ammonia is going straight up to the liver where it gets dealt with. So it makes sense that the intestine doesn't have a way of synthesizing glutamine. It uses glutamine. The ammonia goes directly to the liver, right? That's how it gets detoxified. Most other, a lot of other places um, has the glutamine synthesis um, reaction so it can package the ammonia as glutamine. On the other hand, glutaminase, the breaking down enzyme, we've already talked about its role in the liver paraportal hepatocytes, right? Coming in from the portal vein, fed state particularly, releases ammonia into the urea cycle, and they excrete, they have a little momentum urea like crazy. Kidneys, when they also have glutaminase, the purpose of glutaminase at the kidney is to release ammonia for excretion as ammonia. So again, remembering that every time you've got a glutamine, at the kidney under those conditions where we are acidotic and in an, an extended fast where we're also acidotic, actually it's that one. We're using the glutamine to release ammonia and produce 
ultimately glutamate that gets that get then yields alpha ketoglutarate. Ultimately, from glutamate, you're getting you know a couple of ammonias released because glutamate also you know, gets um, broken down. Alpha ketoglutarate generates the bicarb that helps to correct the pH, and the excretion of acid as ammonium ion helps us correct the acid pH. So this is important, very much so in extended fast and acidosis. Small intestine has glutaminase, that's for energy, really pretty much all about energy for the intestine. And similarly, immune cells, and I mentioned that in passing, but you should know that too. Immune cells really love glutamine as well. This is the enzyme again, so this is all repeat. I'm just gonna remind you the key points about glutamine synthetase. High affinity for ammonia, right? Takes up ammonia very avidly. Low KM, high affinity. Any um, ammonia that's there, even if low concentrations, it will take it and make it into glutamine. That's very important in tissues where you're trying to not allow ammonia to be toxic to them. Some additional and some repeat about glutamine. Key points, right? Glutamine read, readily moves in and out of tissues. It's, it just readily diffuses out of cells, avidly, or you know, readily is taken up by other tissues. Intestine, liver, kidney, and renal cells, the pancreas, other organs, glue, glue goes in and out. It's the major carrier of nitrogen between cells and tissues, told you that before. Primary energy source for intestine and small intestine, right, and immune cells plays an important role in acid-base reg regulation. And again, thinking almost solely on just having us think about metabolic acidosis as that, that example. Kidney takes up glutamine, releases ammonia for excretion as ammonium ion, also produces a bicarb through the alpha ketoglutarate oxidation. Um, and Glutamine synthesis in muscle is important under all conditions. Ma muscle is a major producer of glutamine. Um, incidentally, just to reiterate that point as we think back to the muscle, in the fed state, dietary protein is providing the branch chain amino acids that are used to generate glutamine from the muscle. And in the fasted state, we're really talking about muscle proteolysis. I didn't point that out, I probably should have. So make a note, muscle, right? Fed state, dietary protein is providing the branch chains that we use to make glutamine, ultimately, you know, we metabolize. Fasted state, it's muscle proteolysis that yields the branch chains for um, glutamine production, as well as alanine, right? I mean, there are other things going on in the muscle, I'm not gonna be complete here. Here's a picture of glutamine synthetase, just sort of an inter-organ um, depiction. And so we're talking about where is glutamine synthetase, and I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna try not to keep repeating myself too much, but just know that these things are happening uh, for different reasons under different physiologic conditions. So glutamine synthetase in the liver is when we need the, to be exporting more um, glutamine. Normal conditions, the muscle is the major exporter of glutamine. The, the uh, liver, those paravenous hepatocytes, glutamine synthetase is active under the condition of a um, extended fast and metabolic acidosis. Okay, so We'll, we'll talk uh, individually, but I'll just I'll say that again. So these, this glutamine synthetase and glutamine export from the liver becomes ever more important in an extended fast and under the condition of metabolic acidosis. Here's the glutaminase, glutamine utilization reaction. Again, pretty simple reaction. Where is glutaminase? Well, we know it's in the intestine, right? It's also in the paraportal hepatocytes, where in the fed state, and I'm going to add a nuance here. In the fed state, 
And separately, in the opposite of acidosis, we talk about alkalosis. So urea synthesis is active. I mean, um, sorry, let me, let me be specific about not urea necessarily. It is urea, but glutaminase activity to yield ammonia to make urea is active in the fed state. We already know that. It's also active under alkalosis conditions. So it's kind of opposite things going on in acidosis, alkalosis. And we'll, I'm going to summarize it in a moment. We also talked about immune cells using glutamine. We talked about the kidney using glutamine, very important in acidosis and fasting. This is just to be complete, whack to the intestine. I mean, when we think about that metabolism of glutamine, it, the, the intestine yields ammonia for urea. It also yields alanine that gets taken out of the liver. Now, the next couple slides are talking about glutamine, or no, next three are about glutamine utilization, just a reminder of what's happening in each tissue and why, and then we'll talk about glutamine synthetase. So, in the intestine, uh, now I get to the broken record part, you've heard this before, so I'm just going to click through it, right? We know it's used in the intestine for energy and for cellular growth, very, very important trophic effect. And I said, what conditions does the intestine increase its uptake of glutamine from the blood? So remember, there's, I told you about the energetics of the intestine, a lot of glutamine coming in from the diet, coming in from blood, blah, 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 right? When do you suppose, um, and I've got this, right? I've got it, I'm, done. I'm just gonna click, I want the rhetorical question. Um, when you don't have a lot coming in from the diet, you learn an extended fast, then you're gonna draw more, the intestine will draw more glutamine from the blood. I hope that makes sense. And it also draws more in under the condition of metabolic stress. This is why when we talk about conditional, you know, conditionally essential, people talk about glutamine being conditionally uh, conditional in the condition of metabolic stress, and it's just um, something that the intestine will. Uh, it, it, it is probably very much linked to inflammation and other um, cytokine changes under metabolic um, stress conditions. Now. Glutamine utilization. We talked about glutaminase activity linked to urea synthesis, right? Active in the fed state. You're breaking down glutamine, giving the ammonia into the urea cycle. Um, and I also just mentioned to you again, hepatic glutaminase is also active in alkalosis. So it doesn't mean that the fed state is an alkalotic state. It's just that they're two separate states where these enzyme activities are coincidentally the same. I mean, they're, they're active under those conditions, alkalosis and in the fed state. The significance, um, so, so let me, let me um, I'll say, I'll reiterate this from what I said in the liver uh, section is that hepatic glutaminase and the urea cycle enzymes are coordinately regulated. When they are active, they're active together, right? Urea synthesis and glutaminase tend to be active at the same time in the liver. Um, another thing I want you to know, and so just kind of trying to keep in the back of your mind as we go through these slides, is that in the liver and kidneys, glutaminase present in both tissues, glutaminase, right, is both in the kidneys and it's in paracordal hepatocytes, right? Those enzymes, that enzyme in those two tissues is completely opposite in activity. So under the condition where liver glutaminase is active, the kidney glutaminase is not functioning and vice versa. So write that down, it'll help it be more clear as we go through these later. 
glutaminase is active under opposite conditions in the liver and kidneys. And the significance of this is that when we need to do something with glutamine, use glutamine to correct pH. Okay, so let's talk about acidosis. I talked about how the kidney has glutaminase activity that's going rapidly, right? To get that ammonia excreted, you know, ammonium ion, we get rid of acid, we generate bicarb, we correct the pH. The significance of the fact that there's opposite activity in the liver and kidneys is profound. So the kidneys are wanting glutamine to come to them so that they can excrete acid, and the liver is not going to be breaking down that glutamine. It's gonna be producing it, actually. It's gonna be synthesizing it. So glutamine synthetase under that condition is gonna be very active, but glutaminase at the liver is not working. So it's reciprocal, and coordinate interorgan cooperativity again. Another example. I've given you lots of examples of that. Does that make sense? Um, now keep on because I think it. Under the condition of fed and metabolic alkalosis, kidney glutaminase activity is not active, right? So when this hepatic glutaminase is active in the fed and in alkalotic conditions, kidney glutaminase nil. All right, no questions. Yeah. Um, then talking about what's happening at the kidney, I'm not going to repeat myself. <laughs> I am repeating myself a lot. So is that clear? The slide clear? I think. Let it go. I think I've animated it though, so of course. And remembering that every glutamine, you're also producing a bicarb with the alpha ketoglutarate that comes from the UVH reaction as well. It helps correct that pH, excreting acid and um, generating a bicarb. Now, glutamine synthetase, and I think I just have two. No, I just have one, glutamine synthetase. So I'm just gonna talk about glutamine synthetase of the liver, parabenous hepatocytes. And again, this is, this is exactly what I've just said. The opposite, right? That enzyme is active in extended fast and starvation, partly because it's providing glutamine to the kidneys, so it can excrete ammonia and, and acid, excrete acid, generate bicarb. Um, and it's also producing glutamine that can be used by the intestine. Um, and that's the significance of that. Liver is working with the kidneys to increase the supply of glutamine to them so we can increase excretion of acid. And the intestine, when you're not eating, the intestine needs additional glutamine, more than what the, the muscle can provide, right? So the liver becomes more important to produce glutamine. Muscle's also producing glutamine for the intestine. The intestine has to have glutamine. So the liver kind of takes up the slack, if you will, in a fast. Now, I'll just give this uh, slide for you just because I've been talking about them. Um, whereas metabolic alkalosis and the fed state, completely separate, totally separate physiologic conditions, acidosis tends to happen in an extended fast. Maybe not as bad as a diabetic ketoacidosis or some of the things that we can implement um, when some, or, or that happens when somebody has you know, pancreatic problems or other clinical things. So I just explained why metabolic acidosis occurs when you have fasting. Ketone bodies are acids, right? We're producing ketones. Pro protein catabolism yields excess acid. Um, and I'm not gonna answer how this works. Kidney and liver working together to help correct the, the, the pH in acidosis. Um, so just go back through that and if you have questions, Think about it. I'll give you a moment to think about it before we depart today. Um, here's a diagram showing the extended fast and what's kind of happening. We've got liver glutamine synthetase, highly active, shipping glutamine out. Uh, we're not really making much urea. Okay, I've got a double bar there as if it's completely stopped, right? It's not. It's just 
50-50 now, right? Instead of 80% of the nitrogen going out as urea, we have less made, okay? So make note of that. It's more like a 50-50 split. Um, intestine, always using the glutamine, generating alanine. If you're in a fast and under this acidosis, you're also making, um, you're using that alanine in, in the liver for gluconeogenesis, et cetera. Incidentally, um, at the same time, that glutamine that, that is being produced by the liver is being taken up by the intestine, sure, yes, but also by the kidney, glucaminase of the kidney is active. So this just summarizes it for you, these con opposite conditions. Muscles still putting out glutamine as well. And then here's uh, kind of a summary chart for you. So you can, for our purposes, if you want to, right, extended fast and big caps and slash or, you know, or maybe just say or, you know, in fasting we are acidotic. Over here I want you to, to put fed and metabolic alkalosis or fed or alkalosis. These are, those are separate, completely separate conditions, alkalosis and, and the fed state and not, um, but similar, these are just a summary of what we're primarily doing. And, and I know I've simplified it a little bit, right, just so that it hopefully can gel, but there are nuances here. In acidosis, we're, so we're excreting more uh, as ammonium. It's that, uh, you know, 50-50 split. Um, in alkalosis and the fed state, about 80% goes out as urea. Um, what's happening at the liver, what's happening at the kidney. First of all, before I say any more, is there, are there questions about any of that coordinate regulation, different activities going on? And I think this is my last slide, clinical applications. So just a few things, a couple slides on this. So stress, metabolic stress, response to injury, um, intestinal glutamate, Glutamine, sorry, gosh, I totally misspoke there. Intestinal glutamine uh, uptake increases from the blood. And in a stress, metabolic response to stress, your body, you know, this is a major insult like major surgery, gunshot wound, you know, um, open heart surgery or whatever. Your liver just can't keep up with the glutamine demand, okay? And there are a lot of different potential uh, mechanisms at play here, but what, what we know is that under conditions where somebody is really uh, mounting a, a huge immune response, a response to injury, burn injury, for example, or, or other um, in, in, you know, intense insults, you get this plasma and tissue glutamine deficiency, essentially, and the intestine uh, muscle is just not, you know, whatever glutamine gets put out by muscle, it, we are catabolic, we're, you know, the muscle still generates glutamine, it's just not enough for the intestine. And the parabenous hepatocytes also uh, don't generate the glutamine that, that the intestine needs. So we get altered function, we get altered uh, immune function. Um, and there have been some um, studies that have shown that supplementation of glutamine under select conditions can be beneficial. Um, Data, you know, there, there, there are more data in some populations than others. Um, trauma and burn injury, some pretty good data about glutamine supplementation that can be helpful. Um, bone marrow transplant. Short bowel, especially in um, short bowel syndrome is when you have just very little remaining intestine for absorption. Um, when we give it with growth hormone, we tend to see pretty good results in terms of helping the remaining bowel adapt. So you think about the intestine and its need for glutamine. By giving it, we can be help. We can help it. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, a little bit of mixed results. Um, for the most part, we say it's not harmful in certain conditions, but then there are other conditions where we say, you know, probably it's not um, not uh, a good idea to give ex ex extra or additional glutamine. Um, there's been some debate over tumor growth, if you give it to somebody with cancer, for example, because tumors also use it. Um, depends on the type of cancer. So that is all. I cannot believe I'm done so early. Y'all are like, yay! I don't know if Dr. Penn has anything to say.
You know that she is here. I'm going to just say she's had traveled from China last night, and she looks great. Considering if I was doing that, I would be completely a zombie. So um, I want to thank you for letting me do this class for years. I've always enjoyed these classes, and I thank you all for being such, you know, welcoming people. <laughs> thank you. So does anyone have questions? I mean, you know, I, I'm willing to stay if you are. Um, no, I yeah, Carly. So, so, Carly, right? Carly um, took up is ammonia and ammonium toxic. And my understanding is um, ammonia in the NH3 form is the primary uh, when it's, because it's diffusible. So when it's in the NH3, now the majority, you know, I did tell you there's a PKA business that leaves it mostly ammonia. We don't allow it. It's not. It is, I'm just going to quickly, quickly answer is yes, it's toxic, right? Because it's going to be in, in equilibrium and it'll go back and forth potentially. Um, mostly when it's in, as ammonia, NH3, it, it is readily diffusible. Once it's in it, um, ammonium, it's got the kidneys to get it out. We talked about the liver failure and it keeps it in the gut, it gets excreted, and keeps it doesn't tend to go back into the blood. So it's, I would say it's a little less toxic once it's in ammonium. Choice and matching oh, the exam. Yes. 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 